All right. Good morning. It is, it is really good to be with everyone today, and it's good to see you all. I, after having been not able to be together for two years, I really do value this opportunity to, to be together and, and to have, have guests, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, as much as we do. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Steve Huntsberger, and I'm the Executive Director of the Indian Valley Chamber of Commerce, and I'd like you to welcome you all to our spring forum today. Uh, we do have a number of people joining us uh, via our YouTube channel uh, and are watching this live, and this will also be part of our library, YouTube uh, library, so you can uh, share this link with others that you think might enjoy it. Uh, this forum series has quickly become one of our favorite uh, of our members. Uh, and I think it's an excellent way to introduce businesses, but also introduce uh, business people to the larger chamber. Uh, I want to thank our host today, Sellersville Theater in Washington House. So let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> they take very good care of us, and I appreciate that. And I also want to thank our presenting sponsor, Clemens Food Group. So thank you, Brad, for, for sponsoring this event today. Yeah, we can give them a round of applause, absolutely. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce our uh, panelists, and then I'll just make some opening comments, and then we'll move into the, uh, to the conversation. So we have Brad Clemens. Brad is the uh, president uh, of Clemens Food Group. Uh, we have Rochelle Berge, CEO of Marcho Farms. Joel Gottschall, Senior Vice President with Gottschall's Quality Meats. And Adrian Ramos, uh, General Manager, JBS USA. So let's welcome them. <laughs> So we are very pleased today to bring you this panel discussion. You know, from the earliest beginnings of European settlers moving into what we would now know as the Indian Valley region in the late 1600s, and by the way, I want to editorialize a little bit here. This term, uh, Indian Valley, is, is an homage, an honorable and affectionate term, uh, and really a way to uh, remember that there were people here before us. So uh, it's, it's, it's this idea of Indian Valley is, is a very honorable idea. Agriculture has been a staple uh, from subsistence farming to quickly moving into the role of bread basket to Philadelphia prior to the Revolutionary War. The Indian Valley has a long tradition of feeding not only the local population, but far flung places. So when I was starting to think about this event, uh, I had two working titles in my mind. Uh, one was Where It All Begins or Feeding the World. Uh, and both of these titles are valuable, and I'm still conflicted as to which one is more appropriate. But agriculture was the basis for the commerce of this community. Fertile farmland grew produce and grains, livestock and lumber for the local markets, Tobacco, textiles, and the lumber industry created wealth, and the railroad's arrival in the late 1800s coincided with Souderton's charter in 1887 and really opened the Philadelphia market up uh, for more easy access. So in many respects, this idea of agribusiness is where it all started for the strong economy of this uh, community. And because of the lush and fertile soil, we had an abundance, uh, so much so that our family farms produced enough to feed feed themselves, but also the far off flung city of Philadelphia. Remember back in the day, it was, it was a day's journey to get to Philadelphia. So today we continue to feed, uh, feed these far off places, and I think our panelists may tell us a little bit about that as well. But this rich history of agribusiness in the Indian Valley is where our strong and diverse economy started, and they do continue to feed the world. This program today, uh, is a way to honor our chamber members that provide this food uh, that we need to survive and is also the basis for our commerce that continues to be an important pillar of our economy. So you did not come here to hear me speak, so let's move right into uh, our discussions. And I'll start off with the same question for each one of you, and then we'll kind of figure out how this is going to work best. Uh, so. Uh, this is a, 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 a formally informal uh, a, a day. So, Brad, I'm going to start off with you. Uh, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Make, you know, make, us the, make the introduction uh, and then tell us about yourself, how you got into the position you are today, and then give us a, a history of your, of your business. Will do. Everybody hear me okay? Okay. 
Uh, good morning, everybody. Some familiar faces in the audience, uh, some current vendor, former colleagues, family members. Uh, thanks for, for coming out, and it's, uh, it's a privilege to be able to talk to you all. I'm Brad Clemens. I'm the president of Clemens Food Group. I uh, grew up in Montgomery County. I uh, actually went to North Penn High School, uh, graduated from North Penn, went to college at Bucknell in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, pra uh, law school at Villanova, uh, practiced law as an attorney uh, at Blank Rome in Philadelphia, and then joined the company in 2011. Uh, live here in, uh, in the Penridge School District, uh, Souderton address, but uh, Penridge School District, uh, my wife Andrea, and uh, we have two boys, Nolan and Wyatt, they're eight and four. So uh, very happy and, and proud to be part of the, the community um, and um, you know, raising our family here in the same place that, uh, that I grew up. Uh, let's see, a little bit about my, my journey at the company. So we have a rule that you have to work outside the business for at least three years. And so I knew graduating from, from college, I needed to do something before I wanted a, a career at the company. And so practice in law, it was, uh, it was a great way to start. I, I learned about corporations and uh, mergers and acquisitions and things like that, regulations. Um, so when an opportunity uh, presented to join the company in a, in a leadership role, I, I took it. Um, we also have a rule that you know, we don't make roles for family. You got to apply just like everybody else. And so I interviewed and got the job and started uh, in the plant as a FSQA manager, which holy cow. That was, a, that was a shock to the system. I was used to uh, wearing a suit and tie going into Philadelphia every day, and boy, that was the last, I think the last time I wore a suit and tie, Steve, other than maybe a wedding in the last 11 or 12 years. Um, but you know, it was great. Uh, really a way to learn our, our plant, our team members, our processes, USDA having to work with the government every day. You know, it's a challenge. Uh, the food business is, it's hard. It's hard work, starts early. Uh, you know, you got to sweat it out every day, and that was, you know, really a great experience for me uh, and a great way to start my career at the company. Uh, I spent some time uh, working with our R&D and project management team for a couple of years. I led our customer solutions team, uh, which is sales and marketing, and then took over in the president role about a year and a half ago. So that's a little bit about me and our, uh, you know, my journey to the role. And then I, there was one more about the company. Yes, okay, right. So you know, Clemens Food Group, um, a lot of you would know us as Hatfield Quality Meats. Uh, it's our legacy, legacy business here in the community. Uh, the company started in 1895, was founded by my great-great-grandfather, John C. Clemens. Uh, we're a family business. Uh, we're actually in our sixth generation of ownership right now. Uh, for those who have been in the community a long time, probably be familiar with Phil Clemens. He was our third generation leader, most recent. And then Doug Clemens was in the audience. Hi, Doug. Uh, who was our fourth generation leader, our current chairman. And uh, now we're making that transition into, into five generations. So 370-ish shareholders, over 800 family members uh, in, in the extended family. Uh, I've always been in pork. Uh, John C. Clemens had a saying, never an empty wagon, uh, would take uh, meat down to Philadelphia and come back with produce. So always in the meat business. Today, uh, we're, we, we would be considered vertically coordinated. So we're in feed milling, we're in hog production, we're in pork manufacturing, but then we also have warehousing and, and transportation. Uh, we also have real estate uh, for those uh, in the area. If you're familiar with uh, uh, the Lansdale area, Talmets and Hatfield, right by the plant there, where the Wawa and Chick-fil-A is, that would be all our land that we've leased out to other, other organizations. So the food business, real estate, in total, we do about two billion in sales, uh, but that took 127 years. So a uh, very, very long time to get where we are and very proud of where we've come from, where we are and, and where we're going. Perfect, thank you. And two new facilities. I don't know if you want to talk about uh, that sure. now or not. Sure, yep, like real quick. So we, uh, you know, legacy business was always Hatfield. Uh, we do get confused at time. Oh, Clemens Markets, AJ and I were talking about, well, where does Clemens Markets fit in? You know, Clemens Markets was part of the family, uh, uh, one particular branch uh, for a period of time, but was sold a long time ago. Um, maybe you can help us uh, demystify that in the community. 
Um, but that's you know no longer part of the business. It's all the food business, main production in Hatfield, but we also have a facility in Emmaus up in the Allentown area. Uh, we have a facility in Coldwater, Michigan, and then we're about to uh, open a new facility right here in Hatfield, uh, our Hatfield North facility, more bacon, more ham, and more sausage. Yeah. That sounds good. I like that. <laughs> Rochelle, would you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Sure. Good morning, everybody. I guess this is on. Yep. yep. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, so my start um, at Marcho Farms was years ago, and then I took a break for <clears throat> a lot of years as well, but I, I literally... Uh, grew up around it. Um, Marcho Farms started a couple years before I was born, so Marcho Farms was like the first born child of uh, my parents, and then uh, I was born a couple years later, and then my sister Julie was born a couple years after that, and so it was just a part of our entire life. Um, uh, the office for the business was in our basement, and um, I enjoyed running on the meat truck with my dad, going to different grocery stores to deliver the meat. Um, I sometimes would be hanging out at, at the, the veal plant, you know, watching the calves get processed, you know, before I would go to kindergarten. <laughs> and, um, and so because of that, I, it's, it's what we knew. It's what was talked about around the dinner table. It was part of our life. And so I really enjoyed business. And so when I was deciding what to study in college, I, um, I picked accounting because during the summers of my high school years, I would do some like accounts receivable and entering bills. And so I did that, and I just thought I would do my four years at college and then go back to the, to the family company and help there. But when I was studying accounting, I found out if, if you took a test, you could get your CPA. And I thought, well, that, that sounds like a good challenge to do. I'll do that. Um, but you had to then go into a firm for two years to, to get that. So I did that. I went to um, Baum Smith and Clements, which is a local CPA firm, and I loved it so much. I stayed for eight years, <laughs> and I just enjoyed being around the other, you know, um, the entrepreneurs that you get to help with. I'd seen that in my dad, and so I enjoyed uh, working with other people that had the same traits, and also husband-wife teams. I was always very intrigued and really thought that was neat when marriages, you know, work together in business. So I got to to help on that side of it. And um, I worked there at the firm until the day I had my uh, first daughter, Rachel. And um, I stayed home ever after, since then. Uh, I homeschooled the girls, and I did some accounting on the side, and also had an RV rental business that I did from home on the side. And um, but then uh, COVID struck, <laughs> and I remember getting a call from my dad saying, you know basically family, we need to have a meeting with the managers and, and the family. And it, it was a, a challenging time and things were changing fast, literally by the hour. And, um, and our, one of our main area of customers, restaurants were being shut down. So there was financial questions that were in play. There was also, you know, employee safety that was in play. And so um, it was really all hands on deck. And that's when I got involved. I had a lot less time to give to homeschool that year. And, um, uh, during that time, right before that, our, our company had decided to get a board, an advisory board, which I think that was a great thing that that happened before COVID hit. And um, then the board asked if I would stick around and do the CEO role. We had not had that a role specific like that before. Um, so I agreed to that, and that was about two years ago. So I'm still really new at this, and um, I have a great team that helps me, that knows much more about it and more experience than I do. And um, uh, my brother-in-law, Chad Yoder, he's our COO. He um, takes care of all operations. And my cousin, Brian, is our CFO and also president. And so, uh, and we got a lot of great managers, key managers that help uh, with it. So I guess, um, should I go into the history yep. a little bit? And uh, don't forget to tell us about yourself, too. Oh, okay, yes. Um, um, so my husband and I, my husband's um, Luke Berge, and we have three daughters, Rachel, Ashlyn, and Heidi, and they're here today. So this is their first official chamber event. And, um, and talking about chambers, I used to be here years ago when I was in accounting. So it's, it's nice to be back. It's been many, many years. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we live in Harleysville. Um, we enjoy RVing and uh, hiking and biking and walking together. And uh, so yeah, we, we enjoy our family a lot. And, uh, and the girls are kind of following our shoes. They, they get to hear about business a lot as well. So I'm glad they can be here to hear from all the rest of you guys too. Um, so as far as the history of where it started, um, my parents, Wayne and Marty Marcho, they were married in uh, 
1969, and that was also the start of the business. It wasn't called Marcho Farms back then, but um, that is when their side hobby of doing this uh, started. Um, my mom was from Lansdale, my dad is from Susquehanna County, Pennsylvania, and he came from a dairy farm. And he loved dairy farming, and he was homesick for the dairy farm, but they knew it wasn't an option to move back up there. They were gonna stay here in the Lansdale area. And uh, they were renting um, a, uh, an apartment at a dairy farm in Lansdale, uh, Norman Landis. And so dad um, got 70 calves and put them in Norman's barn. <laughs> and, um, and dad had some jobs. Um, during this time period of probably dating to early marriage, uh, dad ran the, uh, the milk truck for Rosenberger's Dairy. He did that. He um, worked on Norman's farm for him. And he also worked at Franconia Propane. Um, after, after that little bit of time, uh, dad made another career move and he started working for a poultry, a poultry company, Lawn Acres in Franconia. And that was a really, um, a critical time because he was learning about meat plants back then. He was still raising calves on the side. Um, but Lawn Acres is where his source of income came from. And he learned a lot. He always talks about Horace Lawn Acre having been one of his main mentors in business. And during that time, mom was working at um, the Montgomery County Intermediate Unit. And uh, they eventually purchased a farm in Harleysville that had old uh, chicken houses on it. And so dad converted the chicken houses um, uh, to a place to keep the calves. And eventually he took the leap of faith and he, he left Lawn Acres and decided to do calves full time. And Horace Lawn Acre allowed him to use one of the Lawn Acre refrigerated trucks to help uh, deliver the calves. Um, so that's kind of how they got there. Um, mom, mom worked outside of the home um, until the month I was born. And she decided to stop working and to help dad full time with the books. Um, but when I was about three months old, the business had a, a significant financial loss and she had to go back to work for about 10 or 11 months to help recoup some of that. And, uh, but ever since then, when she came back, she has always uh, been a mom and also working full-time in the business. She still works in it full-time uh, today. <laughs> so um, the Harleysville farm, um, where most of it took place was here. This is on Orchard Lane in Harleysville. Um, this is where most of the business activity took place in the 1970s and 1980s. And this is also where um, it became a fully integrated business, similar to what Brad said about being fully integrated. Um, again, that's where you're, you're making the feed, you're raising the animal, and you're processing the animal and, um, and uh, selling it then for the meat. And uh, one of the great benefits of being fully integrated is that you can have good control over the quality of the ingredients and the food that's going into the animal and also consistency of the product um, that's coming out from that. Um, in this picture here, um, the, the barns to the right, those would have been chicken barns at one time that got converted. And then the far left, that would have been where the first feed mill uh, was put up, where dad would make the feed himself there. And those tractor trailers would be trucks that would uh, send the feed out to the to uh, the farmers that would be growing calves for us. Um, today, the, the family business has extended to many people that um, are, I call it a family business, are, we're only in generation two, but a lot of team members are part of our family. And we have about 250, 260 team members, and we have over 100 Amish farmers that raise calves for us. So this is um, a, a picture of what, um, a sample of an Amish farm uh, would be where the calves are raised and then the sack of feed that's feed that's made in Franconia that's shipped down to the farmers um, to feed to the calves. With, um, with producing um, our feed and also uh, raising the calves, um, the quality that I had mentioned um, kind of, be it became the trademark of what um, of what dad was able to produce with the quality of calves. And today we continue with that. We have our own veterinarian, nutritionist, and um, they help oversee the animals. Um, and it's that high control and, and the quality that we have is what uh, Marcho Farms is still known for, is known as having some of the best, if not the best veal in America. Um, and um, th here are some samples. These are just um, chefs, things that restaurants throughout the US, these are pictures off of Facebook that chefs have shared 
of Marcho Farms uh, veal and lamb. And um, so that kind of gives you an idea of the high end, um, you know, cruise ships, hotels. Um, it's a, it's a, definitely a more expensive protein. Um, and it's all throughout the US from the West Coast to East Coast up to Massachusetts. Um, and we do also export to some areas, some tourist areas of islands, things like that. Um, also, in addition to uh, the restaurant trade, we rely very heavily on our retail, which would be grocery stores. Um, this is a sample of some of the products that we put out into the, the grocery stores. We do a lot of our sales out of Franconia, go through distribution lines, you know, like US Food, Cisco, large ones like that, distribution places um, that send our product out. And we also make deliveries to some large chain uh, grocery stores too, where we use our own trucks to deliver into there. Um, more recently, the biggest change um, was that we added an advisory board and that was right before COVID. And um, today we have three outside board members, which is something um, I'm really excited about. It's kind of unusual to, to be going from generation one to generation two and having three outside board members at that time. And they've just been a great um, accountability and stability um, to the company. <clears throat> and um, we also have family members that are on the board as well. One of the new things we started last year, which we're gonna to continue to do, is um, every October we have a family contribution meeting. So this is, um, that's our family there, that's the three generations, all of them. And uh, in October we take a look at what our profits are for the year and we have a certain percentage and we set that money aside and then the family comes together, including the youngest ones, and they come prepared uh, to give us suggestions of what charities, nonprofits they think are worthy for us to be supporting and what that money will be used for that we give. And they give a recommendation of how much they think we should give. All of us come prepared to do that. And so that's our way of, um, it's the first thing we're trying to teach them about business is um, the skill of giving. And um, it's something that we want them to learn at a young age. So it's just a natural thing for them um, before they get into their careers, whatever those careers may be. Um, that we just want to teach them about being generous. It was something that was very important to mom and dad, and we want the next generation um, to share in that as well. And we feel by doing this that this is one of the main reasons we feel that business has been blessed over the years. We feel as, we, as we're stewards and we give back um, that God just continues to bless the business, and so we're, we're really thankful for that. So that's a little bit of a history. Perfect. <laughs> and I think Rochelle forgot to mention probably humbly so, uh, you are a ma the major veal producer in the U.S., correct? Number one, out of Franconia. And the other interesting thing is we don't oftentimes think about veal barns being in, in Lansdale, so that was also, uh, <laughs> it's, it's been around for a while. Joel, would you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your journey, and Gottschall's quality meats, please? Uh, yeah, Steve, I uh, appreciate the opportunity here today and appreciate everybody coming out to, uh, to listen to our stories. Uh, hi, I'm Joel Nice. I'm Senior Vice President of Gottschall Quality Meats. I reside in Lower Salford with my family um, and my three children, Claire, Mark, and Ethan. Um, we go to Franconia Mennonite Church and uh, are very involved in the youth ministries there, um, MYF, the Boys Club. Um, my family enjoys uh, hiking. We love to hike mountains. You can talk to me about that. Uh, usually summer vacations where I have a hiking trip and uh, as well as I, I dabble in, I say dabble now, but I used to love to sail um, up at Lake Nakamix and then I still, uh, still have a sailboat and, and try to get out a few times a year. Um, that's a little bit about personally about myself. Um, uh, what I do in the company is I um, you know, I work on a lot of processes about how to move the company forward and building processes to do that. Um, and that might include uh, design, automation, um, anywhere from building projects, getting involved in that, um, and all types, of, uh, all types of strategies that are involved. How I found myself here today, um, I found uh, part-time employment at the age of 14 um, in high school. Uh, and uh, found this job, and it was close to home, and uh, would uh, do sanitation at nighttime uh, with uh, other high schoolers. And uh, as I review back on that, I think that's, that was quite 
entertaining in the stories that I have with uh, high school boys and high pressure guns at nighttime in a meat plant. Um, but uh, I did that through high school and then, um, and then found myself full employment after high school and working in the packaging department of, of me and another uh, lady would, would package product there. Um, and did that for about two years and said, I think there's more. I think there's more. So um, at that point, I, I entered into the maintenance department there at Gotchels and, and found that challenging. And I worked with a, another mechanic there for about a year. And then, then he moved on, and, and the show was mine to run. Um, and I made a, a commitment to myself um, during that time. And I don't think I wrote it down, Steve. Um, but I made a commitment to learn something new every day. Really drove that um, in and uh, really developed a curious mind. And anybody that knows and works with me closely knows I have a lot of questions. Um, so, uh, you know, developed a curious mind and worked at troubleshooting. And then also um, problem solving came after that and, and continuing to develop that. And I developed that for the next 10 years working in the maintenance departments and, and of course growing uh, with Gotchels. Um, and becoming that you know supervisor manager of the maintenance departments, and after a while, I found it, found close to you know 30 mechanics between a couple plants reporting to me, um, and then from there it went on to plant engineer to vice president of engineering, um, and then here late in the last last two years was uh, senior vice president of the company, and and those some of those um, some of those traits that I learned early on and continue to develop of of problem solving and having a curious mind still serve me serve me well today. Um, a little bit about the, um, so that's, that's my journey of how I got here today. Um, a little bit about the uh, history of the company. Well, who is Gotchels? Gotchels is a further uh, food processor uh, facility. Um, and we, uh, we employ right around 550 employees across three different facilities. Um, and it really all started with Marvin Gotchel back in 1945. Um, he opened up a local butcher shop there, right on Mill Road. Um, we're still where we have one of our facilities today to serve the local community. Um, and then passed that along to the second generation, which continued to grow that company. I'm really taking it to uh, Philadelphia, to the local markets, the local farmers markets, and growing that. And I think at the height, they, they had eight farmers markets where they would take their product down to. Um, and that got passed along to the third generation. The third generation came in the early 90s um, and really was tasked with grow the company, continue to grow the company. And that really instilled in them. Um, and, and really with the start of that, they, they decided to buy a small one-truck smokehouse to, um, to, to help support this, this business they had at the farmer's markets. Let's, get, let's make an offering of, of smoked products. Um, and that continued on until early 2000s. In early 2000s, there were, the decision was made. There was a lot of uh, pressures coming from the farmers markets um, to work longer, to work more days, and the, the, the business decision was made to let's, let's go fully to a fully uh, further processing facility and, and exit the farmers markets altogether, which was, was just absolutely huge. Um, and... and um, was the right move at the right time. Um, and there was a, that, those first couple of years were pretty rough, and I was part of those years, you know, and I, was, uh, I wasn't at the level I was now, but I was there uh, ground floor um, working there in the plant. And, um, but the business continued to grow, you know, and got legs under it. In 2005, we, we expanded that out to Lebanon, PA, where there was another further food processing plant. Um, that uh, was Daniel Weaver Company out in Lebanon, PA, and, and bought that. And we also picked up some, some more product lines as well as, uh, as floor space, another plant to, to be able to produce product at. And uh, the, the products that really started to take flight that was very small in the 90s and that continued to grow was this, this product line of uncured product, all natural product that was very small, but continued to, to continue to grow. And we found we found an area to grow through private label and through co-packing during those years and, and really has accelerated and continues to accelerate the company. Um, and the company continued to grow and grow and, and I don't remember how many times we've come back and we, we need to add another line. 
we need to add another manufacturing line, right? Um, as I look back, that was, it's, it continues to be very special, uh, the growth pattern. Um, in 2017, bringing us a little bit closer up to date, uh, we opened our third location down there in 2016, 2017. The ownership was looking down the barrel of a, a thriving company um, with, with talented, loyal employees and made the, made the decision to go ESOP. And really what that was is to continue to, to, to gain stability within the company, um, to give ownership to, to all the employees, really giving them a piece of the pie and saying, you know, this is yours, How, help make good decisions. Um, and, and in return, uh, financial gain for, for all. As the business does better, you know, we want to, uh, we want to support each individual with that. So that was, to me, that was a huge blessing um, and, and really has, has continued to drive the company even to this day. And the, um, not the last chapter, but the current chapter that we're in is uh, really made in 2021. We looked through and COVID was, uh, was really something that I'm sure we'll all talk about. We continue to talk about, but that was really driving the food industry and accelerated retail for us. You know, the retail turkey bacon lines just accelerated greatly during that time, feeding, you know, feeding the grocery stores and feeding people. Um, uh, we continued to grow and we're really um, saw that as a, as a huge plus during that time. Um, wondered how we were gonna get it all done at times. Um, but the current chapter is, is really saying, hey, we're, we, we should get into branded, more Gotchels, and tell the story, tell the story that we have of, of Gotchels and being a, becoming a more, um, putting more strategies and more emphasis on Gotchels product line. Um, so we're starting off with that, uh, with obviously turkey bacon, cured and uncured turkey bacon, but also launching a new, a new product line of Angus steak bacon is our current um, that we're, we're launching uh, actually very, uh, just earlier this year. So very exciting times for, for Gotchels quality meats. Thank you. I'd like to hear a little bit about the importation at some point too, so maybe you can talk about that. Adrian. I uh, am excited to have you here today, too. You probably are the newest member of the, this community and still, uh, still making your way around and really glad to have you here with us today. Uh, you come from a, a really unique uh, corporation. So I believe, is, I believe I'm correct when I say JBS is the largest protein producer in the world. That's correct. That's correct. So I will, I'm looking forward to hearing it. So t tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got, because I'm sure you have an interesting story about how you got to where you are now, uh, and then some of the uh, history of JBS. It's not so unlike his story, but yeah, it's interesting enough. Uh, I'm Adrian Ramos. Thanks for the pleasure of being here today. I appreciate the opportunity to come here and speak to everybody. I'm, uh, I was born and raised in Seattle. Went to school out there in Washington State. I have uh, five children. My son, Adrian, soon to be 23 tomorrow. Uh, my, another son, Ryan. I have a nine-year-old named Matias, my middle name. And I have twins that are seven, a boy and a girl. The girl came out last, so she's the baby baby, right? <laughs> so I, I had these, these aspirations of, of going, going the full mile in school and doing the bar and wearing nice suits and brushing my hair great every day and not wearing a hard hat and all that good stuff. But about 23 years ago, tomorrow, my life changed, and I headed out to the beef facility that we had local to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to get health insurance. I'm going to go out there for a little bit. I'm going to make some money, and I'm going to get back to school, and I'm going to go back and get fitted for my suits, right? And, and when I got out there, I, I had a really great supervisor, a mentor, I'd say, and, and somebody that I really wanted to emulate. And, and I started seeing a future out there. Now, I, I started as entry level as you can start. I, I was squeegeeing the floor out there, right? So. And I wanted an opportunity to do more. We have grades in, in the industry, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have the same thing, right? Like based off the skill level and what you do. So if you're, if you're pushing a squeegee, you're, at, you're grade zero, right? So when you see those entry level pay rates, when you go from facility to facility, that's the one at the bottom. Now, if you're doing some, some other higher, higher skill job, more difficult job, it pays more. So I can remember begging my supervisor and the superintendent, hey, can I do something that I can make some more money? And they're like, well, you know, if you, uh, if you keep the floor clean, you know, you can go up there and practice in between, <laughs> in between your sessions cleaning the floor. Our, 
my start time was later than everybody else's because I had to wait for him to get the floor dirty before I can start. And I stayed later than everybody else because I'd stay late to clean, right? So I got to come in early and start learning the jobs. And then throughout the day, as I cleaned the floor, I'd have to change out everything I wore and then go up there and learn some jobs. And I got to learn some higher graded jobs. And eventually they needed help. So they pushed me into one of those higher graded jobs. I wasn't ready, but I got to do it. And um, I became a trainer and went into quality assurance and, and a lot of different roles. I became a production supervisor. I did another tour in quality assurance, uh, general foreman, superintendent, uh, quality assurance superintendent, and, and all these different levels. And uh, after about 14 years, I've been in the industry for 23 years, if I didn't mention that, since 1999. And um, after about 14 years, I got a call one day, and they asked me to, to move to Finney County, Kansas, Garden City, Kansas, if anybody's familiar, great place. Not really. But, um, <laughs> and uh, I got an opportunity to go out there and manage at a higher level. I was uh, promoted to what we call an operations manager, and I got to go out there. Bigger facility, a lot more people, different demographics. Uh, it, it was a great opportunity. And um, after I got that right about where, where I loved it and was starting to enjoy it, and I thought Garden City was okay, I moved off to Iowa. And then after that, the same company, not nearly as good of a company as JBS, but what we call a competitor, like Western Family is to Coca-Cola, right? Um, they uh, had me go out to Nebraska, and after spending a couple of years out there, this opportunity arose. Um, a, a lot of the people in JBS USA are people that came from this other competitor company, and uh, we knew each other to an extent, we knew each other through word of mouth, so this opportunity came my way, and I was blessed to get the opportunity to come out here to Souderton, PA. I had been out here about a year and a half now, and uh, if you spend any time in Kansas, Nebraska, and and Iowa, you, you know it's a blessing to be out here. This is a great location for a beef facility. Uh, don't want to go anywhere. Um, a little bit about JBS. Uh, as you mentioned, it, it's the number one protein producer in the world. You can Google it. It's, uh, it's a leading global food company providing diversified, high-quality products to customers, approximately 100 countries, six continents. Um, we, we actually have uh, businesses in, in several continents. And uh, this includes meat and poultry products. We got a portfolio of recognized brands and innovative premium foods. JBS USA is a majority shareholder in Pilgrims as well. Um, that's the largest poultry producer in the world, so not just protein. Uh, Swift prepared foods, and that's what you see on the majority of our bags and boxes. If you go to the store, you don't see JBS, you see Swift, right? Um, it's a subsidiary of JBS USA, a, a consumer packaged goods company. It's focused on protein-centric prepared foods in both private label and branded offerings. Uh, about the Souderton facility, it's the largest cattle slaughter facility east of Chicago. We employ just over 1,448 team members, about 1,200 of them hourly, about 250 of them are salaried. The building sits on 200 acres, it's 608,000 square feet. Our coolest storage, storage capacity, like where we keep the cattle once they're slaughtered and once they're being cooled, is 4,400 head. Our, our distribution center capacity is about 70,000 boxes. We process approximately 500,000 head per year, uh, 21,000 cases of box beef a day. Uh, we source our cattle from more than 1,100 producers. and just a little bit about the plant history, and uh, those from here may know even more than myself, but the plant was originally constructed in 1880. Abraham Moyer, famous name around here, right, took over the plant in 1910. By the 30s, the first refrigerated, re refrigerated truck was purchased, expanding the facility's ability to deliver box beef. Um, in 1981, the barn addition was added to the facility. Um, it was designed by Dr. Temple Grandin. Um, in 2001, that happened in 2003, we became Smithfield Foods. Uh, we also got the distribution center in 2003 where, where we hauled our 70,000 boxes. The plant was purchased by JBS in 2008. Uh, at JBS, we believe in being actively involved in helping our communities. In 2021, we donated about a half a million dollars locally um, through our hometown strong initiatives. We donated 417,000, uh, a lot of that to the Montgomery County Anti-Hunger Network, another 200,000 to the Franconia Township Park over there for the playground upgrades. We have a Better Futures program and, you know, providing Better Futures for, for our team members. And our Better Futures program is about providing them the opportunities for them to go to school and expand their horizons and for their dependents and their immediate families. So our, our team members will pay their tuition to go to school, will we'll pay their wives or their husbands tuition to go to school or their sons or their daughters. And we just started that recently. We currently have 68 of our team members are, are their family members enrolled in, in, a, in a local school. We're working to partner with more with more uh, community colleges that we have out there because what, we have 1,448 team members, as I said, and you know we got people coming all the way from Reading and all the way from Allentown, maybe, maybe Quaker Town, a lot of people from Philadelphia, and we're working to branch out and partner with more com community colleges and colleges in those areas so we can get 
all our demographics going, but we look to increase the number of people we got enrolled substantially uh, by then. And I guess that's it. Thank you. I think one of the interesting, th a couple of interesting comments here. Um, th these, these businesses give back to the community. Uh, I think you heard that, and I think they'll probably talk a little bit more about that, but they, they, they understand that the, this idea of, of building up what's around. Uh, the other thing is, you guys all grew up in the business. Brad, I don't think you talked too much about it, but I'm sure you were you were you were doing stuff at the plant. But you all four of you were 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 growing up in this business, which makes me think about something too. I'm we're going to do some audience participation. So, how many of you worked in food production? Maybe not necessarily one of these four plants, but I would like to see a raise of hands of of how many of you at one point worked in in food production. So maybe maybe it was one of these plants, but let's get some hands up. So there's, there, yeah, there's there's a lot of people out here who, who, who have done this. Um, you know how difficult this is. Um, and and it is a part of this community. I mean, it, it's it's in the bones, it's in the it's in the DNA of this of this community. So I'm going to throw this next question out and whoever wants to start off with it can start off. So so food production is vitally important on multiple fronts. We have health concerns, we have safety concerns, we have national security concerns. And until recently, uh, you know, we kind of took these things for granted, right? Um, this stuff, it, it just kind of happened. Um, so what are some of the unique challenges that you all are facing right now, and how are you addressing them? I can kick it off. Um, you know, COVID uh, changed everything. It, it, it really did, uh, and boy, if you weren't if you weren't taking care of your people before COVID, well, you better be taking care of your people now. Uh, so I think you know first and foremost, Steve, team member health and safety that, that's got to be number one. Uh, if people don't feel safe; they're going to leave. Uh, they'll they'll leave your company um, tomorrow to go to Gotchalls, Marchos, JBS. That's a, you know it's the truth. Um, so I think you know that that. Uh, that's like never been more front and center than it is now. It's gotten better. I, t I think it's got definitely gotten better, but that's absolutely number one. Uh, and then, you know, engaging with your people. Um, you know, it's, it's real easy when you're in a leadership position to uh, lack empathy, lose empathy. And I think, you know, staying connected with your people and what they're going through. I mean, little things, what we take for granted, like transportation and housing, that's a big deal. Um, and that would be uh, an example of something that's you know, definitely uh, a challenge right now, um, housing for sure. You hear about it in the news, obviously, but um, there is a lack of housing, of affordable housing for hourly team members. There is. Um, you know, not only, you know, right here in the Indian Valley, but uh, greater Philadelphia and, you know, across the United States. So that's definitely an issue. Um, the other thing I would say, and then I can hand it off, uh, immigration. Um, because of a shortage of, uh, you know, domestic labor here in the U.S., boy, if you're not looking at visa programs right now, you, that's probably something you need to be taking a look at. Uh, we have a lot of hog production here in the Pennsylvania. We're the largest uh, raiser of pigs here in the Commonwealth, uh, in the top 10 in the United States. And, uh, you know, we always hoped that it would be, you know, folks that grew up in the Commonwealth and wanted to work in hog farms, and unfortunately, they just, they don't. Uh, and so we've, we're probably 50% of our team members on our hog farms now are from overseas. Could be from Mexico as an example, and... You know, they need help with visas and they need help with housing and, and they need help for their visa renewals. So, you know, investing in HR uh, and having uh, experts either internally or, or, you know, that you're connected with, uh, that's, that's definitely a challenge uh, right now and something that we're very focused on. Let's just go right down the line. Yeah, I would second that, the, the labor for sure. You know, it takes a ton of people to produce food for America. And, um, and that became very evident. Um, at one point um, in the past year, I'd say uh, 12 to 18 months ago, um, it was such that if you lost an employee, it was almost impossible to replace that same number. So you had to do everything possible to not lose anyone. It wasn't like 
there's five more people waiting to come in to replace that one person. And, and so it felt like at a certain point we were just really losing ground as far as the size of the workforce. So it, we took some drastic steps. We did three or four pay increases for our hourly team members in about a 12 month period, which that was unheard of uh, to that aggressively go up. So um, just to give you an example, um, before COVID, one of our basic starting rates would have been around eleven fifty per hour, and now that's more closer to nineteen dollars an hour, and that's you know in less than two years. So it's it's been significant, um, um, just the inflation that's taking place right now. But um, that was really going strong in the past year. Um, uh, one that was specific to us, I didn't mention earlier, but about half of our, almost half of our sales are, is lamb meat. And um, about a year or so ago, one of our challenges we faced is we found out our main and almost only supplier of lamb was going to cut us off. Uh, they had need for the lamb, selling it themselves, and we had about a day's notice on that. And so, um, thankfully, you know, we can say now we're stronger now than we were back then, but... Um, uh, thankfully, we've been able to make a lot of direct relationships to growers, to ranchers out in um, Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, where we're going directly to the ranchers that are raising the lambs instead of relying on a supplier to, to bring that to us. So um, that was like a, a specific challenge we faced, and we're developing to just make those ties stronger those, so that we can have more control over our supply line. Well, I definitely echo uh, Rochelle and Brad's uh, on the labor issue. I want to speak a little bit more specifically uh, on that um, or maybe branch out from that. And that is uh, just overall depth of knowledge on the plant floor. You know, it's, 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 it's a tough job, you know, and it's, um, it's hard work. It's, it's rewarding work. It's hard work. And, um, and it's not always glamorous work. But... Um, I would say depth of knowledge and and the companies mixed with uh, mixed with the the challenges of this past few years as well as a growing company so continue to educate on on the basics of food processing and of course when i was growing up my supervisor taught me how to put together machinery and showed me and and i knew it um and you look through and there's generations of people that have gone through and sometimes they found better ways and sometimes they they didn't find such good ways. So we call that tribal knowledge. It was starting to happen in a big way at Gottrell Quality Meats about how to do certain practices. And, and we, we found ourselves a few years ago, we said, we, how many times, we, we say this in our, our leadership meetings, how many times do we need to learn that same lesson over and over again? So we've really start, sent out to, uh, to build uh, training, training programs, and not, not for food safety, those were developed, but for everything from how to set up a grinder and make videos in English and Spanish and, and teach them and build them, um, get trainers on the floor to train these people um, how to do this job and make it, make it really a, a living, breathing document, not something that we're going to put in the file and say, mission accomplished, we're done, but continue to use this uh, day and day and, and refresh training on this and, and build those programs. I think... Um, and we still continue on today. We find new ways. You know, we say, "Ooh, where does that at? Where does that sit?" And if it doesn't, we add it to it, um, to to continue to bring that that depth of knowledge up into our our plant floors. I think you guys hit on this is on. Yep. I think you guys hit on just about everything. Uh, COVID was obviously a huge challenge, and. Uh, it, we've we've always really worked hard on the the health and safety of our team members, but more from a standpoint of not not allowing them to get injured, taking care of them, training them right, and not allowing them to develop you know carpal tunnel, trigger finger things of that nature, and not allowing them to get hurt day in and day out. But COVID definitely changed the landscape of everything, and obviously just keeping them safe from that perspective. And the onset of this whole thing was really difficult because. Nobody knew what to do. I, I think all of our businesses here were probably deemed essential businesses at the time. We got to find a way to stay open. We got to find a way to keep everybody healthy. We got to find a way to make everybody feel safe and not only make them feel safe, but have their families feel safe that they're coming home to them safe and that they're not bringing anything home. And without a playbook, without clear direction from the CDC, because I, I think the CDC just kind of followed all of our leads, right? They kind of came into our plants and said, what are you guys doing? Okay, that's great. That's what we're going to do then. And um, <laughs> You know, um, it, it was tough. Um, 
everybody was questioning what we were doing and, and we were doing everything in our ability and, you know, throwing all kinds of money at it, throwing all kinds of education at it. And, and I think we put together some really good programs, worked with, you know, um, infectious disease experts, went out there, put a lot of partitions in, made one way signs, put, put six, feet, six foot footprints apart, put a tent in, put infrared temperature cameras, you know, to take everybody's temp coming in the door every day. I, I could go on for days on this, you know, hire a whole department to, to oversee this so we don't delegate it to the people who are over here trying to already run the operation and just trying to keep team members during that time and ensure that everybody knows that we're trying to do the right thing by them. And again, not only them, but their families, you know, even myself going in and out of the beef plant day in and day home. I get home to mom and she's like, are you okay? Wash your hands, change your clothes. And, and everything else, and, and I know that everybody else is going through that at the same, at the same rate. Um, but again, the, the labor issues, you know, and, um, and and what we deal with, what we talked about, tribal knowledge, and and everything else, and how how deep people are. You know, it's it's not just about if you lose somebody, you hire somebody else. It's that you know, it's it can take years to replace that person. It's it's not just you can hire ten people. It doesn't matter, but but to incorporate everything that somebody knows, everything that they understand, their skill set, you know into somebody it could take forever so really really um where we used to have a really deep market we used to have really deep succession and and we used to have no issue getting applicant flow of the right people and getting people in places and covering people and and it's no secret that the demographic we have coming coming in right now you know our kids we, we didn't teach a lot of us didn't teach our kids to come out and be be butchers and work at that level you know we, we taught them that we want them to go to school and we want them to dress nice and everything else and uh j just uh but those are the applicants we have now, and these are the people that we have to develop. And, you know, it's, it's a challenge. It's a privilege. It's, it's hard to do, but, you know, if it wasn't hard, it's job security, right? If it wasn't hard, the four of us wouldn't get to sit here and talk about it. Everybody else would be out there doing it, right? So um, I could keep going about other challenges, but I think the other three questions illustrate a lot of those. That, I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head, Adrian. If it was easy, everybody could do it, right? And uh, it, it, takes, it takes some special people to do that. Um, I should mention, too, we may have time for Q&A at the end. So if there's, if there's anything that, that comes up, uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll have a few minutes for that. So, so put, your, put your thinking caps on. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is supply chain. Um, this has become a topic of discussion recently, specifically as we think about oftentimes security, um, like from a national security standpoint. Um, so what have you all seen uh, regarding raw materials? And this can be, this might include feed. You know, Rochelle, you guys produce some of your own feed. But um, so what does that look like moving down the supply chain as you are procuring? Many of you are vertically integrated too. So what does that look like? You know, bringing bringing the products in, but then also moving it down down the line to where it eventually needs to go. Because there's a lot of moving parts here. Yeah. So for here in, in Hatfield, and then our Michigan facility, our biggest raw materials pigs, um, and so we do own a lot of our own pigs, but we also contract with others. Uh, in general, we've we've been all right, Steve, uh, in terms of hog supply. But uh, actually, right now, it's probably the tightest it's been in the last decade. Um, a hog is actually, it costs more right now than the value of the meat. Um, so uh, it's tight. It's definitely tight in terms of hog supply. Uh, and the cost as a result is, is very high. Uh, going into the hog is the feed, the same thing. Uh, corn, soybeans also very high. Uh, we utilize uh, hedging strategies on our grains, uh, which helps us um, in a way protect against some of the cost. But uh, that's definitely is definitely a challenge, and uh, the other thing that you know kind of uh, overlaps with your last question is disease, right? So uh, any type of uh, you know commercial animal, you're always worried about disease and, and herd health. You see that in the news, things like African swine fever for pigs or PEDV, uh, poultry. You're seeing it right now. So disease is always a concern. Uh, and you're constantly trying to implement best practices uh, to prevent against disease um, because that, that's the one thing that can just wipe out an entire, not only an entire barn, but an entire region that you're seeing right now in like the Lancaster area, for example. So preventing against disease, working with the federal government and the state governments on collaboration efforts, um, those, are, those are unique challenges and things that are playing out right now. 
Yeah, related to being uh, vertically integrated, um, sometimes, you know, there's seasons where a certain area has higher costs than others. Maybe your feed's really expensive one year, or maybe the calves are really expensive one year, but you get a break somewhere else. Uh, but right now, there's pressure on all areas, and, and as we're all hearing in the news about food prices going up, there, there's definitely valid reasons for why, um, why the prices are going up on um, the cost pressure that's out there. So for feed, uh, two of our main ingredients are fat and whey protein that go into the feed. And just to give you an idea, in the past year, uh, since 2021, um, fat is up 87% in cost and whey protein is up 96% in cost. So that's just the feed that's going into the animal. Then the, for us, the calves, um, a calf, a veal calf is a male calf. So um, we don't buy the females. The females stay in, in dairy for milk. So a calf uh, for veal is a byproduct of the dairy industry. So we're buying at auctions the male calves that are born into dairy that dairy doesn't need. But right now, um, there's also a lot of pressure on um, the dairy, um, the beef industry is also needing those male calves. So there's a lot of competition there. And so it also makes it tight for us too. And it puts the price up of what that calf costs to buy. And then when it comes to packaging the meat and uh, shipping the meat out to the customers, the pressure there is anything oil related. So, you know, the, the plastics, the trays that your meat comes in, the film that's over, the meat, that's all a byproduct, too, of the, the oil industry. And then the cost of fuel for the trucking, whether it's our trucks or the third-party carriers we're using, just the the, um, the extra cost there, it, it's hitting everywhere. And then that's why we're seeing the prices in the grocery store so high for pretty much all proteins and many areas of food. Yeah, for gotchas, um Supply chain shortage. I think it's a. I think it's a daily topic at Gotchals. Um, we are not vertically integrated. In the beginning, I said that we are a further processor, and I, I made um, need to make mention of what that is. So we buy in all our uh, raw material in from other harvesting uh, other harvesting plants. It could be it could be the the people up here with me today, but it also could come all the way across from the United States. You know, Midwest is a huge uh, supplier for us for for Turkey um, um, and, and as well as some of the southern states. Um, but I, I would think our biggest, probably our biggest concern right now for supply chain is is film. Um, and um, we've been put on allocation a few times. Um, and and I got a, I'll, I'll share an interesting, uh, uh, summarize this interesting email from one of our, uh, from our buyer for, uh, for packaging film. She says, if we don't get if we don't get our order from last week and we only get 70% of it this week, we should be okay, you know? And I thought, I had to read that email a few times and I thought, wow, is this, is this the state of affairs we're in? Um, and uh, we've always been okay. You know, we've, um, you know it's, it's, it's concerning, but we've been okay. And, and since then, the pressure has lifted. And, and, you know, we used to be able to buy film for our package machines for the, for the bacon and different products. And... Uh, three or four weeks and now we're now we're getting pushed out to 12 plus weeks so really drives inventory inventory through the roof um, and when we can get it we buy it now um, raw material uh, avian flu is out there um, we um, I, again talked to one of our procurement officers and said what does that look like and said losing over um, right now the US looks like we lost over over five million birds um, five million plus birds um, from the industry, from our uh, and um, and that represents about two and a half percent. So not not as bad. Um, you hear it about it a lot in the news. We were concerned. Obviously, we don't have raw we don't have packaging film. We don't have raw material. It's going to be really hard to produce our products. Um, but we've been okay, and the and the supply chain um, has held up to this point. Um, um, other things. So I'll just ramble off some other things here. Labels. Sea salt, forklifts, dextrose, um, paper for our products um, seems to be uh, yeah we're in, uh, dextrose is uh, for our ingredients uh, for our products is on allocation currently. Forklifts is somewhere close to two years out to buy forklifts, um, and sea salt. When I heard this one, I said, "Did the 
you know, is a sea now, is the ocean now fresh water? What's, how can the seesaw possibly be, you know, a problem? Um, but, but here it is, here's, here's the state of affairs. But, but all in all, I really have to reach out and tell us our, our buying group, our procurement officers have just done a phenomenal job of keeping the plants up and running and, and securing uh, the plants needs. Really, really appreciate that and all the hard work that they put into it. It really sounds like we're all facing the same challenges in that regard, but no surprise there, right? Um, like I said, I, I'm happy to be in, in Southerton, Pennsylvania um, for the beef market, you know, best place you want to be. It, it's definitely harder pr to procure fed cattle out here. Um, Pennsylvania is a good supplier of, of cow, cows out here, but fed cattle come more difficult. And just like our industries or any other di industry, the trucking industry is facing the same challenges that, that we all face in getting people out there. And I think if you got to make a decision, are you going to drive around Iowa three times and go home tonight? Or are you going to drive out to Souderton and come home tomorrow? I think people make the decision to drive around Iowa or Indiana or, or Nebraska. So there's times we have a difficult time procuring our cattle. And, you know, that comes at a cost, of course. You know, we're going to keep running. We're going to get everything that we can. But there's days that we become a little short as a result of that. We are, we did set up some meetings with the Pennsylvania Cattlemen's Association recently, you know, and hopefully that bears through and we, f we find some good synergy out of that. Even if we do, you know, and we get people feeding what we need and doing what we need, it takes 30 months for that to take root. So, so there's a lot of things in the, in the pipeline there. Like I said earlier, we, uh, we buy from over 1,100 producers, and that number continues to grow as we continue to go out there and find more places where we can procure this from, uh, the volume of buyers that we have running around out there, the number of events that we go to, you know, where you have to be involved and really get to know people and get on a first-name basis with a guy who, who feeds 30 head every year. You know, it's, you, you got to know this guy. You got to be involved with this guy. You got to go to the events with these guys, and, uh, and, and it's a good time and everything, but it's, it's a lot harder to procure things than it was once upon a time. And it's not just in the raw material, you know, what, what he was referring to is I'm on a first name basis with more vendors in the last year than I have been in, the, in my first 20 years in this industry. First name basis, speed dial, name on my phone and all that. And um, it, it does affect your inventory because when you get things, you make sure you get it. Things that we all have min maxes in our supplies, right? We all look and say, when you get down to six of these, we got an automatic order that's going to come through so we can assure we don't run out of those. Well, where it used to be six on a min max, now it's 18 on a min max, right? Because so your inventory is building up and you're making sure you don't run out of things. And I, I'd venture to say that probably all four of us have ordered stuff off Amazon in the past year. Or it's, it's that serious right now. And uh, it's that hard to procure things. It, it really is. And, and before, where we used to have really dependable people, and not to say they're not dependable, they just, the workforce that, that everybody has to deal with in order to get things made and procured they're not quite as dependable as they were once upon a time so now we have a lot more vendors that we deal with you know we might have our primary vendors but we got our second and third and fourth where in the past we just needed the one and uh, and we're not price shopping we're just trying to get what we need in order to run the facility in and when you slaughter 2,000 head a day you can imagine the volume of consumables you go through and, and it's just a challenge, and we work through it. Now, our procurement team's done a real good job. Our supply manager, purchasing manager have done a good job, but it's, it's never been more challenging to be in those roles. Thank you. Uh, you, got, you mentioned poultry, and for many, many years, there was a major poultry producer. Uh, Rochelle, your dad started with Long Acres, and I know I have a few Long Acres out in the, uh, in, in the, in the audience today, so I want to give a shout out to the Long Acre family, too. So they are no longer in the poultry business, but still uh, an important part of the, uh, the business community here. So thanks for, thanks for rem reminding me about that. Um, two more questions, um, and maybe Adrian, I always make you start, I always, I always f have, you've always started last, so maybe I'll give you the opportunity to start, <laughs> start off this time. Um, so what are some of the things that you and JBS are seeing for the future of your market segment? I mean, I think we've talked about some of these things already, but, um, and you all have different, so while you're all protein producers, I think it's different enough. So I'm, I'm curious what you, what you all see for the future of, of your businesses. I, th I think we'll probably have similar sentiments, but like I alluded to earlier, there's, there's not so many, you know, once upon a time, a butcher in a supermarket was a trade, right? You know, and, and that's something that people did. It, maybe it was even a family business and you drove through city to city and town to town and you saw a lot of butcher shops. Well, I don't think that's the case nearly as much anymore. We, we work in commodity bof box beef, right? You know, fairly large pieces. We're, we're not a steak ready facility that those do exist, but for the most part, you know, we might 
we might send product to our, our sister companies that, that do that case ready work, but that's a small volume. And the, the future of our industry, from what I see, is more value added product, more case ready project, which for us is obviously a challenge because it means more real estate, more labor, more consumables, and, and things of that nature. But that's where we go. We, are, we already try to break it down to the best of our ability and you know get it to the customers where it's as ready to go as it can go right now. But, but that's where the market, the demand in the market is right now. That's where the margins in the market are right now. People just don't want to deal with the more commodity products. They, they want it to come to them ready to, ready to eat and ready to go. And, uh, and that's where I see the future of our market going. Yeah, Gotchels has um, has really been on a, a growth run here for the last 20 years or so, 15, 20 years of uh, somewhere around 10, 15 percent uh, growth rate. And um, as we look into the future, we we continue to see that going. You know, that number continues to get much larger the larger you get. You know, um, but you know we have plans on continuing to build. A lot of our building is coming from uh, Lebanon, PA. You see here, and it's um, you know. The, Quiet Road of Mill Road, and we have a plant there, and we have our distribution and headquarters and in, uh, in, uh, off a of schoolhouse. But the real the real growth right now is coming from our Lebanon facility. We have land up there, and and we have a production facility up there. That right now we are uh, we're building on a uh, 68,000 square foot addition um, that's currently under construction, and and we do have the steel and the panels, and we're we're getting all the materials. So um, so that that is going well. Um, yeah, we're going to uh, continue on, continue on with the growth of, of turkey bacon, uh, continue on with the growth of, of healthier, you know, I think our charge is continuing to grow with healthier, great tasting Gajos products. That's, uh, that's our outlook. I, I did have turkey scrapple not too long ago, and I wasn't sure because, you know, I'm a, I'm a pork guy. It was pretty good. It was very good. So you guys... I, I, I love I love the, the the unique products that you put out so and I think that's what people are looking for so Rochelle um, one thing I wanted to share was not specific just to I don't think our industry but it's something in talking with growth and also just opportunity that the one statistic I've been thinking about recently that feels very real to us is uh, just related to the makeup of of the work um, population so um, there's a graph we're going to throw up there on um, the makeup of the workforce right now. Uh, so in 2024, um, it's expected <clears throat> that this will be the makeup of where the different age groups are. And um, I'm focusing mostly on the 55 and older. And I don't know if it's just our company because of the year maybe our company started or if everybody's seen this, but um, the group of 55 and older um, because it's also the baby boomer time, um, we're starting to get into a time period where there's so many significant people and team members that fall in this age group. And when I think about what that age group represents, like for our company, and I'm sure all of your companies as well, is that 55 and older group just has so much like industry experience, um, that tribal knowledge is is coming from them um, the technical skills the skill sets that they have and how will that be able to be replaced um, they know the history of their company they've been at for a long time they're usually great leaders within the company culture what makes that company the you know the fabric of that company and there's also a lot of leadership um, that these people represent in very key positions and so it's something um, that I've been <clears throat> thinking a lot about and um, Currently, right now, our company is probably about 28% in that age group. But um, if we go to the next graph, um, what this is showing, because of the makeup of the baby boomers, we're about to enter a five-year period coming up. Um, we're on the verge of it right now. It's actually already starting. But over the next five years, about through 2028, um, every day in America, there's going to be 11 to 12,000 people turning 65 every single day for the next five years. And so this is like at the pinnacle of that. It's not something we'll probably experience again in our lifetime, but um, there's just so many key people in key positions um, that fit that demographic. And so it's, it's something that definitely we're having to be strategic about and think about so we're not caught off guard with that. Um, and just to give an example why this is so real for us, like last month, um, we had three people that we celebrated their retirement, three really you know, key people that we're going to miss greatly. And uh, next month, um, uh, 
Stan on the right, and the guys took this picture for me, um, Stan on the right is retiring next month. He's a, a really important part of our sales team. Uh, thankfully, in this situation, Brian on the left, um, he was identified by Stan a couple years ago. Brian uh, worked in on the production floor, and he helped with quality assurance, and they just noticed that you know he does a really good job when he's sending out samples of meat, um, FedEx, and they uh, noticed his attention to detail, and so um, a year or so ago, we needed more help in sales, and they asked him if he'd be interested, and he's been doing a great job, and thankfully now when Stan retires um, next month, Brian's ready to fill in the shoes there. So that's like a, a really great, smooth transition, but there's a, a lot more coming behind that that we have to keep preparing for just to maintain where we're at, let alone growing the company. So this is something, you know, uh, that a, a lot of time and attention uh, is going to continue to be put on what that looks like. And it's also causing us um, to just become more flexible and open-minded to what does that look like when people are retiring, these these people that meant so much to our business. Some of them have been there 30, 40 years. Um, and I think that's pretty common in the protein industry. You get a lot of longevity. And um, so on the next slide, we were just showing that some of the things that we've been doing uh, recently as, as we've had a lot of retirements, um, some, some are going like two to four days a week. Um, some that have real high specialty knowledge, we're asking them if they're willing to come in sometimes to consult with us as we're you know, making the bridge to the new people that are learning those skills. And it's been a real win-win for us and, and for the people that are getting to come back and, and help with, on a very part-time basis, um, reduce responsibility, sometimes finding what, what does that person really enjoy doing uh, and what causes them a lot of stress that you want to kind of get rid of that and, and focus on what they enjoy because maybe, maybe they'll stay around a little bit longer if uh, those other areas are peeled back where it's not as high of a responsibility. Also, seasonal work. Um, uh, some people, they know with retirement, they're going to be traveling a lot during the summer, but we've had some specialty uh, help come in during the winter months to help us reevaluate some things. And the same can be said for summer. Some people just love working outside when there's work to do at the company um, and that they'll be helping us sometime with summer help. And usually it's a mix of all the above, but my feeling is I, these people meant so much to the company. There's so much of who the company is and they're not always replaceable um, in the same way. And so I'd rather see someone um, that could be with us several days a week than zero days a week, because I think it's a win-win for them and, and for us. So that is something that's on my mind for like the, the next five years of a challenge that, that we're facing. And, and thinking of that at the same time, we're focusing on growth. A couple things come to mind one just uh, to echo on the people side you know just continuing to meet people where they are we have to do that to be able to grow uh, the meat business uh, out in Michigan for example uh, we have a lot of people they do not want to work five days a week it's true so uh, we implemented uh, what we call a flex schedule where we're only we're working uh, four 10-hour days and we have shifts teams a team b team c team uh, and each team works four 10-hour days. It works really well uh, because people are able to get that third day off. Actually, sometimes they can take it during the week, which means they can then go to the doctor's office, for example, or maybe go to a, uh, a kid's appointment or concert or whatever it is. And so I think the point is for, the, you know, for me to continue to grow, we got to be flexible uh, in some of these work arrangements. We certainly see it on the professional staff as well. You hear about it with the remote work. Um, we're piloting virtual Wednesdays uh, to actually uh, maybe officially doing uh, we're calling them flex Wednesdays for the professional staff. Um, if you want to work in the office, you can. If you, if you don't, you can work remotely. Um, you know, things that we would not have thought about even considering, honestly, uh, pre-COVID, uh, we got to be progressive on things like that, uh, again, to be able to continue to grow uh, the meat business. We're very bullish on pork. And so for the future, uh, you know, just feel like it's a great protein to be in. Uh, so many different applications, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. One thing would be the international markets. Uh, you know, we harvest 22,000 hogs a day uh, between Hatfield and, and Coldwater. And, you know, as a, as a packer, you got to sell every piece. And that means the pieces that folks here in the U.S. don't want to buy, which means uh, those international markets, we need them. China, Japan, the Philippines, Mexico, 
Uh, and so, you know, for us to be sustainable long term, we've got to have cooperation at the federal level uh, with these other countries to be able to uh, move meat uh, that there isn't a demand for here in the United States. So that would be something else that comes to mind. The last thing I was thinking is, you know, the plant based thing. Holy cow, how does that affect everybody sitting here? You know, it seems like it was hot for a while. Um, it seems to have cooled off at least right now. I'm frankly, hoping it continues to stay cool. Uh, um, you know, but certainly, you know, something that uh, you know will be a challenge, uh, especially as people are trying to be more health conscious. You know, especially processed meat. You know, being more uh, cognizant of that. So, you know, that's something. Yes, we're bullish on on pork, uh, but also boy, in the back of your mind, just always thinking about and trying to make sure we're positioning our products kind of like Gotchalls with the all natural uncured products. If you know, if you don't have that in your portfolio, there's definitely a, you know, a piece of the population that you're missing out on. Perhaps when we do this program in another five years, we'll have those. I know you guys don't want to hear that. Uh, we may have those alternative, those meat alternative uh, producers here. I know you don't want to hear that, um, but <laughs> Uh, we will certainly. Well, I know we'll all, all embrace them if they are here. So <laughs> it's one more. It's one more option. Um, so one last question, and I think we'll have a few minutes for for Q and A here. Um, so you all represent mature, um, successful businesses. So turning to a little bit more of a general business question, is there uh, what what kind of advice or what specific piece of advice would you give to younger businesses or business owners or professionals or just people that are working um, as they uh, perhaps encounter some of the common issues that you may have uh, encountered over the years? So Joel or Rochelle, and then start with either one of you yet, so you guys can, can fight over which one wants to start first. Um, when I was thinking about words of it, advice, um, probably the thing um, that I've learned, only being in this for the past two years, things that have helped me the most or uh, things I would say were worth our while, uh, the first would just be um, just remembering for us, like, we're not a meat business, we're a people business, and I think that can be any at any business. Um, uh, the people are the key. The people are what uh, makes the business possible, whether it's the customers or the team members, but uh, we're in the, the people business first. Um, the other thing from being in a family business I feel like I've learned is, so we're in between the generation one and generation two, and I'm just so thankful at this early stage that we have three outside board members. I know for many businesses, they may choose to wait till they're in generation three, four, or five to bring on that many outside board members, but my advice there would just be to, um, to you know, at least uh, evaluate it and think about the benefits of that um, because there, there's so much good that comes out of that with, again, stability and accountability and ideas. And um, another thing, um, I've gotten involved quite a bit with HR, with hiring team members, and um, especially like at the leadership level. And um, I'm not tied to this company in any way, but something that's been a big tool to me is um, predictive index. Oh, yeah. it's, um, it's where someone just takes like a, a 10 minute survey. It's not a pass or fail at all. It just helps you understand how they like to work and what environments are best for them. And it's, it's all about trying to put the right person in the right seat because if you get the right seat for the, that person, they're gonna enjoy the job the most. And if you try to fit someone in a seat that they weren't meant to be, it's not gonna be good for them or for the company. And so it's all about finding ways for people to enjoy their job the most um, with the way that they um, tend to like to work the best. And so that has been tremendous. And I pretty much, um, we wouldn't, I wouldn't hire anyone, um, you know, superintendent or supervisor level and above without it. It would feel like going in the dark to me um, to do that. So that would just be another thing. It, it's not free. It, it does cost to have that, but it's something that's great for the work world. Yeah, as I thought about this question, you know, I <clears throat> looked back and I thought, well, what would I tell Godchalls 20 years ago? You know, what would I what would I speak to them as a smaller company that's going to grow, you know, fairly rapidly um, in the next coming years? And I would, and I speak to that, and I speak to those those small companies today as 
is mentorship programs, mm-hmm. leadership programs, really, you know, diving in um, to to that, um, grabbing a, you know, I'm a you know, big John Maxwell guy and grabbing a John Maxwell book and, and read it. And if you haven't done it, you know, as, as entrepreneurs haven't done it yourself, grab it and, 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 and get together and, and talk about that, you know, talk about the chapters, talk about, I like to, when I, when I do one-on-one leadership with some of our team members there at Gonchols, you talk about, you know, there's there's 28 years of, of mistakes, you know, that have that have been made, um, and get to talk about that. That starts to really soften things up pretty quick. On, you know, when the, uh, the vice president is talking about, you know, things that didn't quite go right, and and how we want the best for those employees, and how we want them to lead, how we want them to lead their people, um, and developing. For us, it was developing core values, you know, and, and Gontrell's core values are uh, love, inspiration, and trust, and really breaking that down, and not, not love on the emotional level, but, but love on the action level of how we're going to treat our individual employees, and really that, that, that comes naturally to uh, when you're a small company and you get to see the owners every day, but as you build layers through your companies, as you build those three, four, five layers to get to the bottom, you know, to the to entry level employees. Cultures change sometimes within companies. Um, and building that and setting those standards right away of how we're going to treat people, how we're going to inspire people to be the best they can be each, each and every day is so important. So so if I could speak to the Godchals of 20 years ago, that's that's what I would say. Yeah, people are our greatest commodity, and you know, we got to educate them. We have to involve them in decisions that impact them. We have to develop them, map out succession plans, make everybody from the janitor to the COO feel like an integral part of the business. Um, we got to hire right. We have to train right. We have to treat right. We have to mentor people, and, and we have to, for what we're doing with our our frontline supervisors, our superintendents, ops managers, and and everybody else. We got to go out there and we got to validate that the message that we're delivering to them and all the training that we're giving to them and all the development that we're driving down that way isn't die, dying on the vine. We got to go out there and get personally involved, talk to people, do surveys, make sure everything's going the way that it's so supposed to be going, make sure our training is effective. And, you know, if, if plan A is not working, make a change, go to plan B, C, whatever the 26 letters in the alphabet are, but validate a lot, make sure everybody's taking care of people, make sure the people you hire hire are taking care of people and, and, and just get out there often, talk to people, get to know people, engage people, mentor, validate, and get people to take pride in who they are and what they do. You know, for me, it's easy because we're JBS. We're, like you said, we're the biggest, the best in, in the industry. So any supervisor that we have out there on the line or superintendent that we have in a department or manager that we have or, or whatever the case may be, HRD or whoever it is, there's only nine other people in the company who do what they do. We have a regional business with, with five. We have our Fed with four. And, and we're the biggest and the best. So, I mean, if, if you're the greatest at what you do day in and day out, and you can, and that's an easy way to inspire people because we all compete. We all got the same numbers flying out at each other every day. If you're the greatest at what you do every day, you're the greatest in the world at what you do. And, you know, some things you can't buy, some things you can't pay for. And, and, and that's where we fire our group up, you know. If, if we got a group of people and we say, if I put the other eight in a room with you, you wouldn't look at them and say, no wonder they can outperform me. And just get, get people to take pride in who they are and what they do day in and day out and be a steward of that. Um, in addition to that, uh, another important aspect of, of running a successful business is obviously customer service. And uh, aside from the people, and you, you achieve customer service through people, of course, but one thing that every great business and every great company has in common is they put out great products, right? And you think of any great businesses out there with great reputations and, and they supply great products and to make sure everybody in your business understands that's what we're here to do, that's what we're going to do. We're going to supply great customer service, and we're going to be the best at it. And that's a lot of the culture, and that's a lot of the, the development that we talked about earlier. Uh, yeah, Steve, I would echo a lot of what's been said, so I just wrote down. So number one, make no compromise in hiring, developing, and retaining the best. Uh, if the, in your industry, in your community, you know, I think sometimes we overvalue experience. You know, it's about cultural fit. It's about cultural fit and, and leadership, especially uh, in those key leadership positions. Um, we, and some it was mentioned earlier, but we have a, a saying in the family, when you're green, you grow. When you're ripe, you rot. And so I think uh, Joel was talking about, you know, just something new every day, having a curious mind, um, but also just, you know, commitment to personal growth. 
you know, commitment to personal growth. And, you know, if you're not trying to be the you know, best version of yourself tomorrow than you are today, you know, I think people see that. You know, I think your team sees that. They expect that out of you as the leader, that you're always trying to get better. And so I think holding yourself to, to that type of standard. Now, it's a journey, you know, 127 years, you make mistakes, uh, be willing to take risks. Mistakes are okay, so long as you learn from them, uh, would, would be something that, that comes to mind. And, and yeah, just don't ever forget the people. Uh, we like to say big enough to matter, but small enough to care. Uh, and I think everybody in a leadership responsibility has a responsibility to make those personal touches with their, their team every day. Uh, because uh, if your team doesn't feel like you care, uh, they'll, they will. They'll go somewhere else to, to find somebody who does care about them. Yep. That's interesting. I, I, in hindsight, I should not have been surprised at any of your questions. I was. You all talked about people. You all talked about leadership. You all talked about culture. Um, I thought there might have been something about finance, something about um, spreadsheets, um, and there wasn't. And I think that's so. So I think that is a, a telling, a telling comment. I, I'm going to switch over to this other microphone. So if anyone, am I on? Am I on? There we go. If anyone has any. Uh, Questions. We would have a we would have a, a, a couple minutes for a question or two. Yeah, and we'll start off with AJ. That's why I sit in the front here. Um, thank you all for presenting today. You guys are fantastic, and um, I'm really impressed with the maturity and journey of all your companies. One question I have is: is with the increasing population in our country and supply shortages in many different industries, are any of you part of any government, whether local? federal or state um, programs that might involve emergency disaster situations where you're, because you have perishable products that you have to provide as much as possible, you'd shut off your retail operations. Is there anything in place like that? Uh, so we did, we in COVID, we participated in uh, some of the federal uh, product purchase programs. Um, so that's that's something that we did. I would say we don't regularly do that, AJ, but that's something that that we've done. Um, you, you know, food banks come to mind. Everybody's always looking for product, and so um, you know, I guess you could say you know, government back. But those are always good things. I I I think to do. So those would be a couple things that come to mind. At this point, I'm not aware of any like directive of um, like the government stepping in and and saying that they're going to direct or ration anything like that. But uh, supplies definitely do get tight for sure. But at this point, no. Yeah, I'll, I'll just echo what Michelle said. Um, the only thing I would say is uh, at times we'd have military contracts for some of their MREs and things like that, and they would they would always specify and if if we go to war this is going to be our ramp up schedule but at the time we don't we don't have any of those and and I'm not aware of any any contracts no no contracts uh, not directly in the manner that you're speaking of but we'll be there when they need us yeah, so, st so i mean in general at least our current experience the the product availability is a lot better um, personally our inventories are the best they've been in 2 years um, so we have inventory uh, it's just stuff, it's just costing more. So at least for, for Clemens, pork, I think in general, service levels are up, inventory levels are up, and labor is better than it was. So that'd be what we're experiencing. Yeah, I'll touch on that as well, uh, Brad. Um, inventory levels are high. Uh, I think last week, uh, so just saw a report where, you know, our fulfillment rate was in 99 point some percent. Um, we can get raw material. We can get we can get the supplies. Uh, labor is is not as bad as it was for us. Um, so so yeah, we're. I, I don't think anybody has any any reason to be concerned at this point. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. Our, our throughput's over ninety percent of where we where we want to be, and and most of that is more efficiency issues on our own part than anything else. Our our inventory is higher than I like to see it. So so we're in good shape there. <laughs> any other questions? We may want to get to lunch. 
Well, this was this was great. I, I thoroughly enjoyed this today. Um, it was it was good to have this group of people here together. I'm going to switch back over and get back to my notes. So the one other interesting thing that I want to point out with this group is these are all family-owned businesses. JBS is family-owned. Gotchall is family-owned in the sense that it's an ESOP, so you have lots of families. Marcho is family-owned, and Clemens is family-owned. I, I don't know if that's an, a, a coincidence or if that is, a, is, a, is the nature of the, uh, of the, of the industry, but I, I found that to be a fairly interesting thing as I was sitting here. So I want to thank our panelists today. Uh, this, was, this was a great discussion. I really appreciated it. I learned a lot about you individually, and I learned a lot about your businesses, and more importantly, um, I think we got to know you better as people. And uh, the way that you all impact the community uh, and, your, and your respective businesses is, is a really important uh, component of that. I want to thank Clemens again for being our presenting sponsor, so thanks, Brad, for doing that. Uh, and I hope you all learned as much today as I did. And for those of you who are joining us for lunch, we're going to be moving down to the Washington House uh, for some, some food. But again, I want to, if you would all thank our panelists uh, for helping us understand this important uh, part of our regional economy and, and the importance uh, that you all play in helping make the Indian Valley a great place to uh, do business, live, work, and play. And uh, so let's give them a, a round of applause. And I hope you all enjoy the summer. Uh, we're going to be taking a, a few months off for, uh, for events, but uh, next big event is our clay shoot in September. So if you like, uh, if you enjoy clay shoot, I hope to see you at that event in September. A reminder, this is going to be on our YouTube channel, so uh, you can, uh, can send this out to your uh, friends and colleagues. Have a great day. It was good to see you all. Panelists, thank you again. That was fantastic.